at your neighbor and say, never give up. I said, never give up. This morning, I want to preach a message to you. And the title of my message this morning is, Don't Quit. Look at somebody and say, don't quit. I said, do not quit. If you can put my PowerPoint on now. Praise the name of Jesus. I'm very honored this morning to bring to us the word of the Lord. I'm going to be speaking. Oh, release the children. All right. All the children who are under the age of, yeah, if you are D kids going age, please be released and go to your children's uh, service or classes upstairs, whatever it is that's happening. Parents, please allow your children to go and be blessed. I want to say that uh, we have the very best children's ministry. Come on, Holy Ghost. Why don't you give the Lord praise for our children's ministry? Aye. Yeah, the lessons that uh, are prepared for them, there's so much work that goes on behind the scenes. We have so many of our media team, cameramen, uh, who are serving to prepare that lesson. And I know that it's high quality. I, you may not know, but I think there's a media house that approached us because they wanted to buy that Dickids. Yes, they wanted to buy the whole Dickids production. But we said no. Because you know what happens? After they buy it, they dictate. After they buy it, they do what? It might get to the point when you're doing Adam and Eve and they say, please include them. And you see, you have no choice. So we said, we'd rather stay where we are. Praise the Lord. Because no one can buy the truth that we have. Praise the Lord. And so because we don't want to compromise and we don't want to bow down to anyone, we decided we will just press on. Hallelujah. Even though some of the cameras are borrowed, some of them are rented, some of them are donated, it's okay. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to be speaking from the life of Elijah from the next few moments. The title of my message, in, in this particular day, I'm going to see how far the Lord will allow me to go, is do not quit. Look at your neighbor and say, do not quit. I said, do not quit. Do not quit. How many of you have ever come to the place where you wanted to quit? I mean, you are thinking, I do not have any ounce of energy left anymore. I want to throw in the towel and call it quits. Some of us have thought about quitting the faith. Some of us have thought about quitting our jobs. Some of us have thought about quitting our marriages. Some of us have thought about quitting on life and saying, you know what? I need to check out of this place. I think I am done living. This morning, if that is you, this is your message. God says with a loud capital letter, do not quit. The key thought this morning is that challenges must come. I want you to look at that word must. You must face challenges on this earth. Jesus said, you will have many trials and tribulations, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. There's none of us on this planet who will live a life without challenges, one way or another. So you're not the first one, neither am I. Challenges must come, but God is always there. That's my key thought this morning. Our key verse is from the book of 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings 19 from verse 12 and 13. It says, and after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a a still small voice. And so it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? I've tried, isn't it? <laughs> I'm trying to imitate the voice of God. 
This is the voice of God. What are you doing here, Elijah? The reason why I picked on the life of Elijah is because Elijah is a powerful and mighty prophet. I'm going to be telling you certain things about his life and you'll be surprised who this individual was. But one of the most striking things about his life, the Bible says he was a man just like us. Very interesting. And we know we use that verse and say Elijah was a man just like us. And he prophesied that it would not rain. And he didn't rain. And that is true. But I got stuck on those words. That Elijah was a man just like us. And I began to study his life in light of those scriptures. And I realized that his life is packed with very high moments and very low moments. He is a man whose ministry has got highs and lows. One moment he has called fire from heaven, the next moment he's running like a rat about to be killed. And yet he's the servant of God. I remember in 2007, I almost quit the ministry. I was this close. Pastor Jemo and I, and together with our team, we had done very many youth events in the city. We used to do an event called Extreme Weekend. Just for youth and high schoolers, we'd have anywhere between 15,000 to 20,000 people. In fact, one time we were, we were 20,000 in a building and we were dancing. The manager called me and said, if you're the one in charge of this group, you will destroy this building. As in, Kasarani was shaking, almost breaking, because we were inside the indoor gymnasium. And we had hit a resonance, if some of you know physics. <laughs> we, had, we had hit a resonance that was almost equal to the frequency of the building. Because we were all jumping at the same time, 20,000 people. And the building shook until the manager called me and said, stop dancing, you're going to break the building. And in 2007, after we had done such an event and brought in one of the greatest artists of that time, Kirk Franklin, into town, right after the event, I almost quit the ministry. One moment we were high. Kasarani, 40,000 people, I think 5,000 people got saved. We were at Bombers of Kenya, it was packed. Man, we had brought in sound like you've never imagined. Some of you who know what sound is, we had brought 24. They're called linear array. When about 12 bass woofers. You just want to get saved, hallelujah. And then right after that event, man, I'm telling you, I still remember. I hit such a low point in my life and I do not know why. I considered quitting the ministry and going back to telecom, safaricom. I considered quitting and going into business. I was so confused, I was so conflicted. And I, I could not understand why, I honestly couldn't. Somebody told, some people told me I was in midlife crisis. Because I was just about to hit 40. I was 38 years old. So somebody came and told me, I will go to the midlife. If you just refocus, you know the way you're told, refocus, look at what you have accomplished. And then look forward to the things that are coming. And all this depression will leave you. I met so many consultants. I met people who tried to counsel me, people who tried to speak to me. It never changed. I was still feeling depressed. Let me leave that story hanging there. I'll come back to it. It's interesting that 35% of pastors battle with depression. 35%. These are global statistics that I found in a, 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 a site that does surveys. And it says 35% of pastors battle depression or fear of inadequacy. 26% of pastors report being overfatigued. Over 50% of pastors battle, listen to me, battle with encouraging people to live under God's word. 
70% of pastors have reported low self-image. 70, that's a very high number. I don't think those ones live in this church. Listen, 70% of pastors and ministers do not have someone that they consider a close friend. 70% live in a tower where they are alone. 27% of pastors report not having anyone to turn to for help in a time of crisis. And over 38% of the pastors and ministers are thinking about quitting the ministry. 38%. That's almost one in every three. A third of the pastors today want to quit the ministry. <laughs> that means out of six of us, two want to quit. Jesus. And that's why the life of Elijah is so intriguing because Elijah is a minister just like you and I. Because we live in a dispensation that all of us are ministers of the gospel. Every believer is a minister. You may not be a pastor or a prophet in the office, but you have a calling over your life and you're doing ministry. The life of Elijah is intriguing because if you look carefully, this gentleman appeared in 1 Kings 17. He lived about 800 years before Christ and nothing is said about his family. No lineage, no father, no mother. We're just told he was from Tishbite, somewhere in Gilead. This gentleman, when I began to look at his life, I realized he appeared onto the scene almost like Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Showed up, took up the tithe, and disappeared. This prophet shows up like that. If you read in, in 2 Kings, it talks about the way he was dressed. He was hairy. The Bible says he was, have you ever, when the Bible describes you as hairy, I think he was really hairy. You can see this in 2 Kings. He describes him as hairy. And he was just wearing something on his loins, like a belt. That's why when John the Baptist showed up, they thought he was Elijah. Because the John the Baptist had the same look. Manuele Mingi. Manuela. So he almost looked like a gorilla or something. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> nothing is said about his birth. Nothing is said about anything. But his life has got high and lows. And the Bible says he was just like us. Look at your neighbor and say, hello, Manuela. Buona <laughs> <laughs> Some of you are rejecting that one. <laughs> listen to me. He knew, listen, this gentleman knew both the power of God and the depths of depression. He knew the power of God and he knew the depths of depression, just like us. His life actually is an encouragement to you and I. Whenever we feel weary, Whenever we are tired of doing the work of the ministry, whenever we are tired of standing alone in the midst of all the ungodliness that is surrounding us in our families, in our homes, in our schools, whenever we feel like the enemy is after us, God's voice is still there. When I felt like quitting in 2007, 2008, Suddenly, God opened two paths for me. Right when I'm about to quit, I actually got two appointment letters for interviews. Because where I was, I, th I said I was done. And I was invited to two interviews. One church was looking for a senior pastor. The other church was looking, the other ministry was looking for an executive director for their ministry. And I happened to do those interviews on the same week. Same week, they just poop popped in front of me, and I took one. Praise the Lord. And suddenly, something started happening in my life that was phenomenal. And I'm going to be sharing parts of that story this morning. I'm going to let you know of several tests that you must go through 
and I label them the tests of provision. What can we learn from the life of Elijah? God will always test you. If you are called of God, mark my words, you will be tested. There's not a single person in the Bible who was never tested. Even Jesus himself was tested. So relax. Why do you want to quit in the middle of a test? Why do you want to give up in the middle of a trial? One time I read the story of an individual who gave up when he was drilling oil. He gave up six, Jemo, you know the story. He gave up six feet before he hit oil. He had been drilling for almost 20 years. Esca uh, 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 I almost said excavating. Is that the right word? Yeah, thank you, Faith. And then when he was just about to hit oil, he gave up and sold the property to another guy who only dug six feet and hit one of the biggest reserves of oil. Because this other guy gave up. He got tired. The other day I read a news article that Uganda has hit gold. Is that true? Kate, we're moving there. Mm. So oil and gold. Man, how many of you seen that? Mataku Hama, Uganda. They've also? They've hit Swahili, praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> so let me tell you the first challenge you must accept, whether you like it or not. God will test you because he'll put you in an environment that lacks godliness. When I looked, you can go to the first point. When I, look at this, when I looked at the life of Elijah, I realized the first place where he appears... God puts him in an extremely ungodly environment. So if you're in an extremely ungodly environment, you are with God. Can I hear an amen? Don't look around and say, hey, about one anger, me. You are actually exactly where God wants you. Why would God put you in an environment where people are already been delivered? What for? I look carefully in the life of Elijah. There had been six kings before King Ahab. And all of them were extremely wicked. Ahab was now the seventh wicked king. Seven, by the way, is the number of completion. That's why Elijah shows up in this ungodly environment. In fact, the marriage between Ahab and Jezebel was an arrangement just for the sake of peace. And Jezebel, the wicked queen, comes with all her gods from where she came from. Asherah poles. In fact, I remember one time we read a commentary where somebody was describing that Asherah pole. You know what it was? It was an image of breasts. In Swahili, to Razita, matiti. Nyo, nyo. One commentary, one commentary said it was, there were poles. So whenever you hear about Asherah pole, it's not just like a pole. It was a pole where every, all the men would pass and ah, ah, double take. Ah. So there was a like, wicked agenda. It is what in today's world you call pornography. And it was all over the place. And there were 450 full-time staff to make sure that those poles are all over the country. 450 full-time prophets of Asherah. Full-time staff. <laughs> Can you imagine how wicked that environment was? I began to think about it. It was so wicked. And this is the place where God puts Elijah. The Bible says... He was placed, and Elijah the Tishbite, he came and said to Ahab, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, and there will be neither dew. Yani, he did not say rain. He said dew. You know how dew is so little, it's even useless. 
He said it will not happen for three years except at my word. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, when God puts you in this kind of environment, you know what he wants to do? He wants to show off. Come on, somebody. God wants to show off. That's why he has put you in a place where he's testing. He has put you in a place where there's an ungodly environment so that you can stand and say at my word. In the name of the Lord. Mutakauka. Hmm. And the Bible says, true to that word, exactly what he said is what happened. That means, because the Bible equates me to Elijah. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm equated to Elijah. The Bible says, Elijah was a man just like us. That means we have the same power. Whenever the, listen to me carefully. Whenever the environment is just right. You have the same power like Elijah. Amen. Many times it's because we are in an environment where there's no ungodliness. So we have nothing to say. That's why the Bible says a prophet has no honor in his hometown. So instead of complaining in the environment that God has placed you, you must understand that you are there and God planted you there so he may show off. I thought to myself, it's interesting that God's words, in today's generation, God's words exist in me. I'm telling you the truth. This is a revelation. Whenever you're put in that environment, you must know that it is you who has that word for that place. Hakuna mwingine. Because you're the only one sensing angalia watu wanatuonyesha nini. Kwenda huko. You get angry, there's a holy anger. There's a satisfaction on the inside. You're looking around, you're thinking something here must change. Something must change. Guess who can change it? You. No one else. That's why God placed you right there. If you're looking around in your workplace, if you're looking around in your home, and you're thinking this environment needs to change, it's you who can change it. If you open your mouth and speak, listen to me, God will be in those words. His anointing, his power will be in your words. Take it to the bank. That's why he has placed you in that place, so that he may test you. I don't know when was the last time you stood up and spoke the word. In that environment, I don't know when was the last time you stood up and spoke. And said, I'm tired of this family living like this. I'm tired of this environment, it's not godly. Something must change in our home. Something must change in our community. Something must change in my clan. Amen. You go to Shags and people are offering a share of pole in some other form. Maybe there's a funeral. Maybe there's a wedding. And you're sitting there thinking, hey, yeah, 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 kuna pepo apa, ongea. Don't shut your mouth. Speak. And say, this is a curse. This has to stop. The other day, my wife and I and my two sisters-in-law, my brother-in-law, were called to go to Moranga. To my wife's family. And the only reason why they wanted us to go there is because there's a, something happening to the boy child. They, look at all, they looked at all their sons. All of them. Were levy, drugs, Messed up, all of them, especially those that were named after their grandfather. And you know, we had just been to the funeral to bury my mother-in-law. And at that point in time, they realized, look at my wife, look at Christine, look at Josephine, look at my brother-in-law Michael, look at me. They're thinking, these guys have something. They said, we plead with you. They said, we plead with you. Let's make a date. Come and speak into this environment. Let me tell you. I said, we are coming, baby. Gala, shonda, sunday. 
We got into the car one of the weekends, not too long ago, actually, it's just a month ago. And we said, you know what, we'll be here the whole day Saturday. And let me tell you, we... Hey, it's because we realize this environment, we are created for this. We are created to, in, to, be, to infuse something into this environment. And let me tell you, man, we did not mince our words. We said it in black and white. We prayed the house down. I mean, so the first thing that's going to happen to you, you'll be tested. And that testing in that environment will prove to you that God is in you. I said, God is in you. Amen. Can I tell you something that you must understand in this New Testament dispensation? God is in you. He's not outside. You know the way sometimes you go outside and you say, Tuangushie moto. Where were your moto? Jesus said, it is finished. I'm telling you the truth. Jesus said, it is finished. He said, if you believe, I will come and I will dwell in you. He says, I will dine in you. If somebody ever asks you today, where is Jesus? Don't point to the heaven. Say he's in me. Because that's where he says he will live. We know he lives in heaven. You know he's in heaven. His presence is there. But actually, for what we have to do now, you are the bomb. Look at someone next to you and say, when you're bomb. Hakuna <laughs> mwingine. The next thing that he was tested, you can go to the next slide, is lack of provision. Literal lack of provision. In fact, do you know something? The Bible says God wants Elijah to hide in the brook called Cherith, where he will be fed by ravens. I realize that the word that Elijah spoke against the nation, he was the first one to live under it. See, I listen, I could have one now. Na unyevu nyevu. Guess what happened? That word affected him first. That's why you must understand that the place that you're in today is a direct result of your convictions. It is directly related to your convictions. As the drought began to bite, God sends ravens. The, the, the Bible says the ravens brought him meat and bread in the morning and meat and bread in the evening. And he drank from the brook. God provided for him supernaturally. There's many explanations to how this happened. Some people believe the ravens went and took bread from the king's palace, from Elijah. I mean from Ahab, King Ahab, and brought it to Elijah. I don't know how true that is, but most people believe that's what was happening because apparently the meat he was eating was cooked. But because he was so wild, he could have been eating raw meat. That's also a possibility. And then the word of the Lord came to him and said, Arise and go to Zarephath because there I have commanded a widow to feed you. In 2008, when my wife and I made the transition and left where we used to serve, Great church. We used to be paid good money. Hallelujah. Our kids were going to a private school. Hallelujah. Pastor Jemo, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> at the end of the month, we never used to think about money. Oh, ching, ching. Look at them and say, ching, ching. Oh. And then suddenly, by my words, you, I said, I'm leaving. Where? Buona sifiwe. Zika kam. I say, hallelujah. Unyev, unyev. I started living under the decision I, have, I had made. We started downgrading slowly. First, we moved from our four-bedroomed house that had enough space to a smaller house. But you know the good thing about the smaller house? My wife is closer. Hallelujah. The ca bedroom is like this. Hallelujah. <laughs> But now I say living under that decision, yeah. I had to downgrade. The first thing, I removed my kids from a private school. 
In fact, I removed them so roughly. They told me the story the other day. I was like, oh, Lord, I was so bad. They said, Dad, you just came to class and said, get out, Tunaenda. <laughs> but that's because <laughs> the next day, the new term was beginning. <laughs> I knew, my friend, if tomorrow they come to school, <laughs> ching, ching. So I told them, get out. Shiro was telling us the story the other day. I was like, Dad, you were so mean. I was like, hey, I needed you guys out like now. <laughs> so we had, to, we had to remove them. We had to make changes. But let me tell you, in 2009, God performed a miracle. Because even as we were going on like this, we were battling in our hearts. Should we just remain in the training center or should we start a church? And so one day we had a meeting with some crazy friends. Look at your neighbor and say, you have to have a few of those. Praise the Lord. And I remember we were sitting somewhere and we were discussing, what do we do? In fact, we had visited a church because we were churchless. We go wherever we feel the Spirit is leading. So that morning, I remember we woke up with Pastor Jemo. We said, I let you attend to the church. to your church. When we were at the parking lot, we had, that was the day Michael Jackson had died. And we had this song that was playing, Billy Jean. And we were like, are we in church or are we lost? <laughs> I remember Daryl looked at, her da at his dad and said, Dad, are we going to church or are we going to a night something? <laughs> and we entered. We entered, we enjoyed the service. In the middle of the service, they had Billy Jean. It's okay, they did their tribute. That day my heart was just smoting me like fire. Nilikuwa na chomeka. Pastor Jemua likuwa na chomeka. And all the other people we were with that day, tukasema, leo tunenda kunyotai kwa hoteli flani. And when we went, when we went to have tea that day, that's when Destiny Chapel was born. Yeah. Crazy friends. And they're here in the service, by the way. I remember David and Solo and Dagi together with their wives and family, they looked at me. In fact, they really looked at me and Dougie, they said, Pasi, this is the church. They said, anything you want, say it. I, I remember looking at David and thinking, Lord Jesus. <laughs> I remember David even said, David said, even if we have to support your family, we will do it. Kanisa lazima tuanze. To me, it was like the ravens. For some reason, those words were so deep inside. I looked at these men and their wives and I said, oh my God. God has actually told us in very clear terms, I will provide for you. At that point, we had nothing. We literally had nothing. We had downgraded. You know, we may downgrade them back at the lowest. I said, you know what? Let's meet for fellowship in my house the next Sunday. And we had, the first offering was 150,000. Buona sisiwe. Praise the Lord. You can give the Lord praise right there. The first offering, first Sunday, we were meeting in my house, 150,000. And the Lord looked at me and said, eh, eh, sasa. God told Elijah, go to this woman. I have already made provision for you. I have already made provision for you. For me, when I was preparing this message, the Lord reminded me that day and that season when I thought, how do we do this? I asked myself so many questions. And God used this gentleman to speak. And they were just saying it like, Ah, we will stand with you even if we have to pay your salary personally. We will pay it. Man. If it was not for that day, there would be no destiny chapel. You know that. But God showed us that he's the one who provides the ravens. He's the one who provides through the widow. So all of you, listen to me carefully. Right now you might be going through a test of provision. 
I want to let you know, according to the word of God, go to Elijah, you go to Zarephath, I have already. I have already provided for you through a widow. That means whatever you're facing now, I want to let you know, God has already provided for you. Amen. This morning when we were driving to church, I almost crashed two birds. Two little sparrows that were on the road. And I'm, I'm driving full speed. And then I, I, I went through them. And my wife and my daughter were sitting at the back and said, Dad, you just killed me. Single. Dad, you just I said, no, I didn't. He says, no, Dad, you killed them. You killed them. <laughs> I'm like, hey, listen, if I had crashed those things, you should have, you should have had kabam. And then after a while, I thought, actually, maybe I did. <laughs> then my wife is in the car says, baby, let me tell you something. I have seen those two sparrows and the scriptures have come to my heart. God says, do not worry about what you will eat. Look at the birds in the air. Don't I feed them? But the rhema that she had was even deeper than that. The sparrow, the birds actually have to feed. Their weight is two kilos. But they have to eat enough food that is one, half their weight. That means if a bird is two kgs, it has to eat one kg every day of food. How many of you can eat like that? Lift your hands. <laughs> so me, I'm about 80. I'm about 80 kilos. So really, I should be eating <laughs> 40 kilos of meat. Kambuzi, kambuzi, mili, nanusu, peke yangu. <laughs> How would you survive if you had to eat half your weight every day? You can't. God is saying if the birds have to eat half their weight every day, and I'm feeding them. How about you? I speak in tongues. Before I finish it, how many of you can finish one kilo of meat? One kilo, other than me and Pastor Jemo. Is there anybody else who can finish one kilo of meat? Joe and Maliza. Who is he? Nimimi tuna Pastor Jemo. I'm telling you the truth. Take it to the bank. Tuko na chambers. Nyama ina nanga uko na jificha. Wow. There was a test of provision that Elijah had to go through. The lesson for me, you and I, is that we walk in, if we walk in fellowship with the Lord, God by his mercy, he will always provide for you what you need. He will give you bread. He will provide through ways that you don't expect. The greatest miracle we went through to see the hand of the Lord was well, somewhere in 2010. I think my son was going to high school. And literally we had no money. And one day I had 20,000 shillings left. And schools was opening on Wednesday. Like it is this Wednesday. <laughs> How many of you have been there? Shule nafungua Wednesday. In fact, I, I said on the group, are you sure it's Wednesday? <laughs> Those are the days you're hoping that, that uh, uh, Matiang will say, we have changed the school calendar. The children have only been home for a few days. To extend it by two weeks. Hallelujah. Wapi. Shule ndiwe na piga kona. I had 20,000 shillings and I needed 220,000. To take my son to high school and pay all the fees for all the other bifarangas that are there. <laughs> when I did the total, I was like, and then there was shopping, and then the kids have come, their clothes are finished, their shoes are finished. Man of God. My wife looked at me and said, baby, what are you going to do? Oh. You know what I did? I gave her the 20,000 shillings that was in my pocket. I told her, honey, go and buy clothes for our son. 20,000. I said, I will remain here with God. I even feel the Holy Ghost right now when I say that. And my wife left, and I went upstairs to our room. I locked the door. 
ushaifunga mlango ukaomba mpaka ukasikia wacha wacha uwepo uwepo wa Bwana as in you have prayed until the house is filled with his presence mpaka you can't even stand i was i was i was on, on my face in the room and i was like i can't even look i'm thinking i might just look up and i will see god's eyes in the room i was like i was crying i was on my face and then right at that moment my phone rang at the exact moment and i normally i wouldn't pick my my call when i'm praying but on that day it's like the lord said chukwe yo simu uone so i picked the call i picked the call and i say hi and this is a gentleman i have not seen i'm telling you god is my witness i have i had not seen him for about four years I had not seen him for four years. I didn't even know where he was. And he calls me, tells me, hey, Pasi, hi, how are you? I'm like, I'm fine. Then he says, you know what? I've been trying to find your house for the last three months. Where do you live? I said, well, I live right next to Airtel. He said, which Airtel? I said, the one in Mombasa Road. He said, I'm just passing it. I'm right there at Airtel. I'm just passing it. I'm on Mombasa Road. I said, take the first left. I mean, literally when he called me, he was like a few paces from our junction. How many of you know that can't be anything else but God? <laughs> and then he comes into my house, he comes to our gate. He doesn't even stay for five minutes. He tells me, I have an envelope for you. I've been holding it for three months. I had it from December somewhere, and today is when I found you. He says, God bless you, and he left. I opened the envelope. It had 2,000 US do- dollars. Look at him and say, dollars. <laughs> when I went and changed it, it was exactly what I needed to the cent. You know the way una badlisha pesa na ikona tu kusumuni tusumuni. Yani everything was exactly what I needed. My wife went shopping, came back with my son, and when they came to the living room, I had put all the money on the table. And my wife looked at me and said, "Babe, where did you get that money from?" I had tears in my eyes. I said, "The Lord performed a miracle." What? I remember my son. <laughs> he was in Form 1. He looked up at, like, where's the hole that God used to drop this man? <laughs> he looked up like, what, Dad? Like, I, I saw the fear of God in his life. He was like, wait, wait what, did he, what, did, what did God do? Like, did he break the ceiling? Because the money was laying on the table exactly the same spot they left me when they were going. Let me tell you something. God will test you. He must test you. So that you know he is the provider. Because many times we can get full of ourselves and think, ah, tulifanya, tulisoma, tulijipanga. And there's nothing wrong with planning. Please don't get me wrong. When we look at the life of Elijah, God performs a miracle of provision. Not once, not twice, but over and over again. The other test that you must be tested, and this you see in the life of Elijah, I think I'm going to do part one of this message. I'll do part two after two weeks. Because I have three more tests and the time is up. God will test you with a lack of companions. That's a test that you must pass. We see Elijah in 1 Kings 18 in a major face-off with 850 prophets. You know the story. In 1 Kings, it says, he told them, why don't you build an altar for your God? But don't light a fire. Build an altar and offer sacrifices to him. And the God who answers by fire, he is the true God. The name Elijah, by the way, means Yahweh is my God. So every time they called Elijah, they were proclaiming that Yahweh is God. And the Bible says, those guys, the prophets, they took a whole day. Some translations say, Elijah began to mock them. And tell them, I think your God is in the <laughs> 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 
One translation says, he told them, your God has gone on holiday. Amen. The holiday was channeling. He mocked them the whole day. Then he says, the Bible says, at the time of the evening sacrifice, the prophet Elijah came near and said, Oh Lord God. If you ever, if you ever want to invoke God's power and spirit, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, let it be known today that you are God and that I'm your servant and that I have done all things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, that the people may know. The Bible says, fire fell from heaven. You know, it's interesting, when I look at the life of Elijah, I realized he's one prophet that actually called fire three times from heaven. Some of you may not know that. He called fire at Mount Carmel in, in 2 Kings chapter 1. The Bible says he called fire twice on two platoons of soldiers that were sent to arrest him. Fifty soldiers, a whole platoon. They had been sent to arrest him because the king had injured himself. And he was bedridden. And he thought, will I live or will I die from this disease? And so he went to inquire of his bells. And Elijah said, Kwani akuna, akuna mungu hapa unenda kuuliza hao mabumbuazi? And the king was so enraged, he sent a platoon of soldiers to arrest Elijah. And they found him sitting on top of a tree, hairy, like a monkey. That's why it says he's hairy, by the way. He was sitting on top of a tree, and they came to arrest him. And he looked at the first group and they said, Kama mimisi mtuwa mungu. God sent fire from heaven and burnt them. Choma water. Then when the word got back to the king, the king said, I will send another 50. He sent another 50 soldiers to arrest Elijah. And the commander came with kiburi. Then the third platoon, that was sent by the king, I think the leader was wise. And he said, Ma uko tunaenda kuna moto. Wherever we are going, there is fire. So he approached Elijah carefully. He went and said, Hey, man of God. <laughs> ah. That platoon was spared. And actually, Elijah said, Oh, yeah, I'll come with you. It is interesting, both the incident of Mount Carmel and this incident where Elijah called fire from heaven, he was alone. In fact, Elijah believed that there was no other prophet who was left except him. And I thought to myself, I want you to listen to me carefully to this statement. I thought to myself, it is interesting that God is not interested in numbers. God will save with one, and God will save with many, but one is enough. Look at somebody and say, one is enough. I'm telling you the truth. God is saying, listen, if they come, praise the Lord. If they don't, praise the Lord, I only need you. There are some of you here, you're thinking, I'm the only one left in this family who's born again. That is it. That is more than enough. Ukonamoto. God actually showed me that the more, you, the more you are left alone, the more his power resides in you. Because Elijah was thinking he is alone. Where were all those other prophets? How come they never showed up at Mount Carmel? I asked myself, why didn't they show up? They were somewhere praying, maybe, and praise the Lord. People have tried to argue and justify. But you know what? He called fire from heaven when he was alone. Three times, and I got stuck there. I realized that God can save with one, God can save with many. 
you will be tested one day when you will stand alone. If you've never stood alone for the gospel, your day is coming. I believe the Lord took me through a major test. When I was sitting there in 2009 thinking I am alone, God already had people in mind. God already had all the crazy friends. <laughs> I could have sat there and thought, you know what? You know the way you ask yourself, did I make the right decision? How come I don't have the money I used to have? How come I can't take my kids to school anymore? What has changed? It means I made a decision that may be questionable. I questioned myself a thousand times. And I thought, here I am standing alone. Yet God had his people. And so you're standing here today and you're thinking, I'm about to give up because I feel alone. I feel like nobody's seeing what I'm going through. I feel like nobody knows what I'm going through. I want to let you know that there are people that have not bowed their knee to that pressure. I'm going to pick up this message two weeks from now. Next week is the worship Sunday, but I have three more points heavy from the life of Elijah. And so I want to conclude my message by saying the reason why this life touched my heart so much is because number one I said Elijah to me was like Melchizedek. But at the same time he's like Melchizedek he's also like me. <sighs> what does that mean? Do you know what it means? I am supernatural. Just like Melchizedek and Elijah were supernatural, they appeared with an agenda from God. You and I have the same calling. Just like Elijah, we are supernatural because he called power from heaven, fire from heaven supernaturally. He was given food by the ravens supernaturally, but yet he was also so normal. He was so normal that he ran away from a woman. I asked myself, I said, my sister, now that we have burnt the offering, <laughs> do you think he would have had the power to do that? The question is, why didn't he? And I thought to myself as I meditated on his life, I realized God is trying to show us something. That when you go through these challenges... Lack of provision, lack of companionships, all these challenges you're going through, you are just like Elijah. So take courage, because we'll, re we'll see at the end of this story how Elijah overcame, but the reality is that he's a type of Christ. He's a supernatural being. In fact, Elijah is one of the few people in the scriptures who defied death. He's one of the people in the Bible who defied death. The first thing he did, he raised up the son of the widow. You remember? He raised up the son of the widow, defied death. Then even better, he himself never died. Now, why does God give us such a supernatural guy living such a natural life? It's because he wants you and I to understand that he's always present. I could have sat there and thought, oh, you know, the reason why that guy gave me that money is because five years ago, he was in a depression. And I went and I ministered to him. And so this is payback. Just got paid. <laughs> I could have easily said that. So that I think it's because of me. But I realized, lo and behold, 
it has nothing to do with me. It is, an, it is a sign from God that I am with you in spite of all that you're going through. How is it possible that he could have called me literally one minute away from my house? He was one minute from my house when he called me. He could have passed and gone to Machakos. But when he called me, I was right there. And I answered my phone, which is quite abnormal in the middle of prayer. And so I'm here to tell you this morning, you are just like Elijah. If you're going through a tough time, I want you to know you are Elijah. Amen. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. You, are in, you are exactly like him. And all the mighty things that he, has, he did, you will do. You'll see them next week. But the reality is you are just like him and nothing can be taken away from you. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. We're going to pray for just a few minutes. If you're here this morning and you're saying, Pastor, I am going through those three challenges. First of all, I'm, I am so incensed with the lack of godliness in my, in my area. Whether it's your family, whether it's your home, it could be your marriage, it could be your community, it could be your workplace, and you're thinking, this place is a mess, oh Lord. And you are thinking of quitting. God is saying to you this morning, do not quit, speak like Elijah. Declare with your mouth what you know the oracle of God is. Elijah was not afraid to speak and say, you know what? Nikubaya, God has had enough with your life style. You king and queen, I'm telling you God has had enough of you. And there will be no rain except at my word. Instead of quitting, speak into that situation. And speak with authority. Because God has given you that authority in that environment. It is at your word that that environment will change and bow. Maybe you're here and you're saying, Pastor, I'm, I'm at a point where I'm struggling with provision. God confirms in his word that he cares for you. He will give you your 250 grams of meat. God will provide for you. He will give you your bread and your oil. He's going to work it out somehow for you. Because God is no respecter of persons. He values every single person in this room. Don't let the enemy think, ah, you know what? Where's him, Chungaji? Where's the Elijah? You are Elijah. You have the same anointing and the same power that he did. Maybe you're sitting here thinking, where are my companions? Where are my friends? I'm the only one. I want to assure you that there's people who are not far from you that are created and designed to be right there where they are with you. You are not alone. Mm. Thank you, Lord. I have a father, he calls me his own, he'll never leave me, no matter where I roam. Let's sing it that one again. I have a father, he calls me his own. 
He calls me his own. He'll never leave me. He'll never leave me, no matter where I roam. No matter where I roam. He knows my name. He knows my name. He knows my name. He knows my every. He knows my every thought. Mm, he sees every tear. He sees each tear that falls and hears me when I call. I want you to go ahead and stand if you're at a place you're saying, Pastor, I'm going through this test right now. And I want to respond. I believe that you are Elijah. The same spirit that was upon him is upon you. God wants you to rise up in that ungodly environment and say something. Don't keep quiet. God is taking you through a test. Rise up and say, I'm telling you as surely as God lives, this environment will change. As surely as God lives. God has placed you there for a purpose. Don't quit. Don't run away. You have all the power to change that environment. Oh God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will send the ravens into our neighborhood. Oh God, I pray. I pray, Heavenly Father, for those who are standing, those who are at a place where they're saying, Lord, where are the ravens? Send them our way, Lord. Remain at the place where God has told you. Remember, it was God who told Elijah, go to the river. Go to the brook and stay there until I tell you. And while he was there, provision lacked. But because he was there by the word of the Lord, God made a way for him. Jesus, make a way. And those of you who are feeling alone, those of you who are feeling, I'm the only one. Why am I the, am I the only one? I want to let you know God has some friends for you. God has people who, are, who have not bowed their knee. You're not alone. Besides, he will save with you. Even if they're not there. So don't give up the fight. In the name of Jesus. He knows my name. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He knows my every thought. He sees every tear. He sees each tear. That falls hears me when I call. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Let it bear fruit in our lives, some 30, some 60, and even a hundredfold for your glory. In Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. amen. Come on, give him praise in the house of God. Hallelujah, if, you, if you're here this morning and you're not born again, I want to ask you, please take some time and come and see me, or Pastor James, uh, or Pastor Daniel, Pastor Joe, we're here for you. If you want to say, you know what, I want to know this God that you're talking about, we shall be happy to lead you to Jesus Christ. So please find your way to us. If you want all the visitors, please make your way to the visitor's room. And that will be a blessing. Amen? Amen. Are you blessed? Yes. Well, we can't wait for next Sunday. Hallelujah. How many of you can't wait for next Sunday? <laughs> Woo! Yeah! Please find someone. Please find a friend, a relative. Invite them to church. We're going to have a powerful worship service. I'm telling you, get ready, get ready, get ready. It's going to be off the charts. Amen? Praise the Lord. God bless you. Have a tremendous week. We'll see you next time.